So who wants to come up here? Uh, it's already pointed out for you, but this is the prostate gland. And the, the key thing about the prostate gland is it lies between, it basically lies between the bladder and the urethra, and it's in, 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 in almost acts like a stop for urine, okay? It is in front of the rectum. So what, uh, what that means is that if you want to assess the size of the prostate, you just have to pick the finger up from his bum. And you, you can quite clearly see that your finger will be in contact with the base of the prostate. It will be in contact with the front of the prostate, but it will be in contact with the base of the prostate. And some will give you some, uh, someone uh, a judge as to how, um, how big it is. Rub against the trigon of the bladder, um, nerve endings, a lot of C fibers, and that's can, can result in pain. Now, the prostatic urethra is this bit. So, this is the bit of the urethra that lies within the prostate. Nothing here. And I, some of you have come, have come to theater and watch me do some cystoscopies, but there's a little nothing which sticks out in the prostatic urethra, and that's called the Vera Montana. Calculatory ducts for men up here. And this will all make sense when we, when we talk about the treatment. I have a little video, I'll put it in on this. The function of the prostate is basically to store and secrete a slightly alkaline solution. And this alkaline solution is in there because it mixes in with sperm. And when a man ejaculates into a vagina, then uh, the, the, the contents of the vaginal cavity are acidic. And, uh, and so it's to neutralize that acidity in a way. And it contains about 20 to 30 percent of the volume of the semen. And do you know where the rest of the volume comes in? For, 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 yeah, and where, where do they connect to? So they're actually the seminal vesicles. So the seminal vesicles are the other end. So that's they lie behind the prostate. It's not on this diagram, but they sort of lie here actually. So EPH is a benign process. Okay, it's a not so cancerous process. So you're going to think about if, if there are things that can happen with the prostate. So in your head, just think about the way I think about it. Is there are only three things that can really happen to your prostate. Either you can get an infection, which is called prostatitis. Either you get an enlargement of the prostate, which is benign prostatic hyperplasia, and that's a, it is, it is non cancerous, or you can get prostate cancer. And we won't talk about prostate cancer, but the two can sort of confuse people. And if you actually look down the microscope, if you take some of the prostate down at the age of 40 and you look down at the microscope, you'll find that a lot of these benign changes are, 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 are present. And, and the hyperplasia is an increase in the number of cells, so the size of the cells are increased, but the number do. And over a period of time, depending on, on the individual, this can result in a net increase in the size of the prostate as a whole. And the point is, it is extremely common. Okay, so a lot of people will have it. Thanks so much. Come back more often. <laughs> so 50% of men over the age of 60 will have it. Now this is quite sad because 80% of 80 year olds will be symptomatic because they've got a slightly large prostate and big EPH. But for some reason we're only treating about 25% of people with this. And uh, 
And, and that's, that's because we don't ask enough questions. We don't ask people what are their symptoms. And if we knew what their symptoms were, we could, you know, we could prevent some of the complications of the EPH. And so it's a very simple thing. It's just a mechanical act. So, um, the trend, the, as the prostate gets bigger, the urethra gets squashed. And so you have a, a buildup of urine in the blood, which is difficult to get out. So people will find that they'll need to push harder to get rid of that urethra, or they may have complications of um, ret retention or hypnoprosis um, as a result. And we don't know why it happens. I mean, it's probably a combination of reasons. There's some racial um, predispositions, Afro-Caribbean guys tend to get a lot more. In fact, the prostate is usually significantly larger than white like, like Caucasian men. Um, there is a, a hereditary component to it. There were some studies that looked at married men, and they seem to, for some reason, get it. I think overall, it's multifactorial. This is probably the most important slide for you, uh, and it's the symptoms of BPA. To go and write it down, it's very, very simple. If you think about it in two ways, you either have EPA, you need to go and pee. There's a component which is very, uh, which which is the act of knowing that you need to go and pee, and then there's the act of actually pointing. Okay, and if you think about those, if you can divide those up in your head, then you can just divide them up into voiding the storage lane in your tracks. So when you take a history of someone as to whether they have got low urine tract symptoms, you just think about it as voiding storage or after they pee. Act of going beforehand and um, afterwards. And then it makes it a lot easier. So I'll just use guys as an example. Um, so you need you need to go, right? And if the abnormal urge, if there is an abnormal urge to go, then that is uh, urgency. All right. So right, you know, just in five minutes you're going to go again. That is a symptom of urgency. If you need to get up many, many times within an hour in order to go, that's frequency. If you're waking up at night more than once, that is called nocturia. Story symptoms, we group them as story symptoms. There's a reflection of having a big prostate, because anyone can have this, women can have this, and it's usually just a function of the bladder being a little bit irritable. Sometimes it's a little bit irritable because you have got a big prostate for men, but sometimes it isn't. And then you've got avoiding low urethra tract symptoms. So these are the actual symptoms that people get when they physically need to be. So what, are, what does a guy need to do in order to get to, to, to go and wee? Right, so first of all, he decides, right, I need to go and wee. So he goes to the toilet. He unzips, he takes his little thing out, and he starts to pee. But he can't, and he sits there and he waits. And he waits and he waits and he waits. And that period of waiting is called hesitancy. A prolonged period of waiting, that is, that is urinary hesitancy. And, you know, and guys will come apart and tell you that, you know, it's really weird, I just stand there for about two minutes before I go, but the other guy just comes in and has a wee all the top. And they feel embarrassed by that. Then the stream starts. And the stream is pretty poor. You know, back when I was 20, I used to put out fires. Now I can't do anything. Right? So it's poor, there's a poor stream. Then they find that they have to strain, use their abdominal muscles in order to avoid. And so that's that's straining. Uh, does anyone know what intermittency is? Absolutely. So you're basically kind of going, you just squeeze those last bits out, and that's intermittency. People who've got structures to their flow will have prolonged nutrition. It takes them a long time to point. And they feel that they haven't completely entered their bladder, so they're stuck left behind. And for some people, they actually physically go into retention. So, what are the symptoms of acute urinary retention? When? So, super pubic pain? Yeah, an area for whatever it is. It could be six hours, it could be 12 hours. Anything else? And sometimes? Yep, so it would be a tender part of the bladder that would differentiate an acute retention from a chronic retention. The, the reason I put this down at the bottom, which is sexual dysfunction or erectile dysfunction, is because there's a lot of evidence now that shows that people who've got uh, enlarged prostates and voiding urinary tract symptoms will also be complaining of sexual or erectile dysfunction, and they seem to go hand in hand. And actually, treating them with things like Viagra and avoiding symptoms as well, which is unusual. So. So do ask about those things, because they seem to go hand in hand. But the point is, if you think about dividing things into boiling symptoms, storage symptoms, or problems after they be, it makes your treatment strategies a lot more easy. Because if I was to say, if this, you know, you had someone that came in with just storage symptoms, would you rather treat them with medication that would sort the prostate out or sort the bladder out? 
store systems as being a function of you know, you know unusual bladder function basically. You'd want to sort the bladder out. Whereas if they only came with voiding symptoms, you'd want to sort their bladder out. But the reality is guys that, and girls don't come and say, you know, I have only storage symptoms, please sort my bladder. They'll, they'll just give you a mismatch so it's up to you to figure out which box they go in. And then you treat the most predominant symptom because that is what they are complaining about. It used to be a thought that you just treat everyone with BPH, but actually that's not necessarily going to help the vast majority of people to treat the predominant symptom. So the other thing to say is that low urinary tract symptoms are not specific to BPH, and not everyone with low urinary tract symptoms has BPH, and not everyone with BPH has low urinary tract symptoms. So that's confusing, but all it means is prostate doesn't mean you're symptomatic. Some people with very small prostates could be very symptomatic. Who have prostates can be symptomatic. So, you know, people who've had radical prostatectomies, women, they can still have symptoms. So there's not always going to be a function of the BP of having a big prostate. So just because someone's got a big prostate doesn't mean they're not complaining about it. So you're only trying to target those people who have symptoms. And then with there are lots of ways that urologists think they're very clever and Scoring systems because just because you know one person's urgency is not the same as another person's urgency, one person's flow isn't the same as another one. So you try to quantify these things, and so we try and we've done this with a little scoring system, and it's basically called the IPSS score. It's an international scoring system. You may be worth knowing about it, and it basically gives you this sort of score of zero to seven, eight, ninety, and four hundred thirty-five, signifying mild, moderate, or severe. Which is the most important question is the question on quality of life. And I'll show you the questions. This is what it looks like. We hand them out to most patients in clinic, and they just go away and they sit there by themselves or with an interpreter, and they go through and they circle what they think. If it's the same frequency, whether you've got it sort of less than five times a day, less than half the time, about half the time, more than half, almost always. And you come up with a scoring system, and again, you know, there's bacteria down there as well. It's all about the quality of life. Because you can have a score of 19 and say, wow, this guy's moderately symptomatic, we need to sort him out. But he could be actually very pleased. If he doesn't want any treatment, because he's actually quite happy with it, why treat it? So you only want to try and prevent complications and treat the symptomatic person. What we always do is try and do a rectal examination. And um, you know, there's been a big move as to whether people should be doing rectal examinations, as in should GPs be doing them. I'm along the school for everyone should do it. Um, what do we need to do in order to do a rectal examination? You know, Glove finger obviously and ask for a chaperone. Okay. Um, it is very important it's a, you know it is it's an invasive procedure in a way. It's an invasive like, examination of the patient. You just make sure you have a chaperone present for it, regardless of you know whether you're a man uh, examining on the man or a female examining on the man. Um, and things we want to know about prostate are size, shape, consistency Modules. And it's difficult to know, unless you've felt all these, what to expect. And that's the problem with your level. But the way I tell people is that if you uh, touch your lips, that's a soft. But your nose, if your nose is firm prostate, and if you feel your forehead, that's a hard prostate. Prostate cancer will have hard prostates, okay? And people with prostate cancer can also have a very soft prostate, and that's why we sometimes do a PSA test. And sizes, you know, once once people not small. Basically, a normal prostate is about the size of a walnut. They're bigger. They, uh, you, can, you can see, you can just, just refer to the entire size of the wall. Now, the, the thing is, no one is expecting you to contact the urology registrar and say, I have a 40 dialogue in feeling prostate. And it's, look, have you had a feel? Is it tender? Is it uh, enlarged? That's all you can say. Yeah, it's pretty big. No, it's not pretty big. The only way you know that someone's big is. Doing it. So it should be part of your abdominal examination, abdominal uh, examinations for all patients that come through the emergency department in general. And there are many other things you pick up in the rectal exam. So that is usually when we say things slightly longer. And sometimes we decide uh, to try and figure out what the size of the prostate is more accurately. And we do that with transrectal ultrasound. So we basically put an ultrasound probe on someone's bum, and you can get a picture of the prostate and this is the prostate. And we can biopsy the prostate with a, a transrectal ultrasound if we're worried about cancer. And if we're not worried about cancer, we can simply measure the size of the prostate. So it just gives us a gauge as to what to expect if we're going to do this sort of surgical treatment for 
because I don't have time on the this program. And does anyone know what a Euro flow meter is? Has anyone seen a flow machine? Okay. So all you're doing is just, I mean, there are different types of flow machines, and all you're trying to do is measure the flow from one guy compared to another guy. Uh, you can tell if someone's got a poor flow or a good flow, and then that way, with your history and the IPS score and all these bits of pieces, you can subject someone to either to surgery or some sort of medication. Remember, any form of medication or surgery has side effects, and these side effects, you know, this is a pretty sensitive part of the body for a young guy if you want to do something to them. So, you know, you, you need all the information you can get to make sure you're doing the right thing for them. So this is a flow meter. All they do is uh, stand, and, stand and pee, and you, you tell guys not to stop, start, don't start, you know, forcing it out. It's not a competition, you know, and it's amazing what people will do. And you can tell them if they're doing that, because you see this trace but like those people, so they force themselves to, 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 to go. It measures a, a weight over a period of time, and they can decide whether it could do a nice little trace. And this is what the trace is. This is a normal looking trace. So if someone had an obstructed flow, they would start off with a decent pressure, or whatever it was, slowish pressure, but they would maintain it over a period of time. And then it comes down. What other urinary pathologies would give you a slow flow? Other than the So prostatitis could give it to you, but they tend to have a very painful uh, stream as well. So that complaint of dysuria and penaltic pain, because that's what it refers to. They find it quite difficult to sit down. Some people can be incredibly septic with it. They have a prostate abscess. Um, and yet they could they could, because of the edema, they can get a slow flow. That's usually a new presentation. What what are, you know, anything else? Switches. That's the other thing. So in young guys. This would, would poor flows and a very kind of weird picture of you, know, you wouldn't expect this guy to be, have a you know, BPH. You always worry about stretching. And they have a very characteristic flow pattern as well. So the other thing that we people really get confused with is this whole PSA. So what does PSA stand for? So that's, 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 what do we use it for? Uh, it's used as a marker of the um, like of production of the prostate it can be therefore used as a marker of malignancy. So okay, yeah, so it's, it's it, yeah, I mean, the first thing to say is it's an enzyme that's been and it's produced by the prostate, and its job is to break, it basically makes a gluten sperm into slightly more liquid sperm, and that's its function. But the thing is, it is, it is secreted by the prostate and other pathologies as well, or and it goes up in, in pathology. But the problem is, it doesn't go up in just prostate cancer, it goes up in BPH and it goes up in infection as well. So just having an IPSA doesn't necessarily mean that you've got prostate cancer. You've really got a good enough test to screen prostate cancer that you use it at the moment. Is there a screening screening program for prostate cancer in Australia? And why is that? Because of the issues of obviously if you start you know, like if you start investing in the second policy yeah, yeah, yeah. absolutely right. Time, and, Absolutely. So the, the problem is, if you were to have a normal PSA, a quarter of people would have prostate cancer anyway. They may not die from prostate cancer, but they still have it. And it gives you the anxiety of that. And actually, not all prostate cancer, we don't want to know about all of the prostate cancer, we want to know about the lethal ones. And the problem is, when you introduce a screening program that over detects prostate cancer, you then over treat it naturally. And then a whole bunch of people have other complications of treatment for prostate cancer, whether it be radiation or surgery, and actually you're not improving uh, on a low or wide population scale, you're not improving uh, population survival significantly. Yet, prostate cancer still remains one of the biggest causes of death in men. So we haven't got it right. So there's a lot of, a lot of research that goes into it. That's why a lot of research that does go into it, a lot of money that's kind of pushed into us. Um, so, key principles or principles of treating. Treat only what you need to treat. Symptoms are only severe enough, you know, treat the symptoms that are severe enough to bother people. And also, think about the complications of BPH, so whether it be acute or chronic retention of urine or renal impairment. Because if they've got renal impairment or they're holding a bladder and they're sitting up, you know, bladder for uh, malicious, these guys need treatment. Don't just send them away and say, well, you'll be fine. Because ultimately, their kidneys will suffer. And the benefits of treatment need to outweigh their risks, and they have to be individualized, okay? As if one, one treatment is killed. You've got a, um, a sort of a, a to shout out some treatments, some medical treatments for prostate uh, for BPH before I move on to the So I have a lot of it. We don't need examples. 
Yeah, and less than one. Uh, anything else? Prazosin is another one. Yeah, that's another one. Any other medications that we can get? Good. And how do how do they work? Uh, inhalation of the gland or what's that tissue? Yeah. Yeah. Wow. The um, five alpha nucleases, um, <laughs> which um, prevents the conversion. Uh, oh, sorry. The yeah. No, you're right. Of um, testosterone to DHT. Mm -hmm. So essentially, prost the prostate, all prostate cancer cells, feed on testosterone. So if you take away the source of food, the cells involute and they, they don't, you know, some die, but they basically they, they do involute them. And so you just have to cut out the source of testosterone in various stages. So 5 alpha reductase is quite a good one because it actually can, prevents the conversion of testosterone to dihydrotestosterone, which is the active component, active food source for the uh, prostate cells. Um, and it has fewer side effects than other kinds of hormone treatment that we give for prostate cancer, where you really want to stop the testosterone because it's actually prostate cancer within the one to enlarge prostate. So the treatment is the same, stop testosterone from acting. But how 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 with how much sort of vigor you do that depends on what pathology you have. Okay, so um, if you were a 50-year-old guy who's otherwise fit and well and had a few symptoms, we wouldn't really have a problem with starting a fire up uh, with starting cancer those. Okay, but if it, what if it was a 90 year old with labile blood pressure and is prone to balls? You would probably have a problem with starting to you're worried about it. Before. So everything is going to be individualized, even though it's the first time treatment. And you've got to think about conservative treatment management and mix it with medical and surgical. So maybe you start with the circles and some funny things with those. So with mild symptoms, we tend to tell people just to, you know, sort out their fluid intake. Something I've noticed in Australia is that everyone loves to drink coffee. That was okay. The caffeine intake is a real problem for low immune cancer, which is they, they irritate the bladder, and everyone knows that you have a cup of coffee in the morning, you're going to be you're going to go at least twice before you know lunchtime or at least once. Because and you don't if you didn't have that, it's not just the fluid in, uh, intake that, that drives this. It's also the caffeine. It's an irritant to the driving of the bladder. Alcohol intake. Nasal decongestants and antihistamines as well. And usually, people with mild symptoms they can control control without medication. Or at least that should be the first line. And this this kind of stuff is done in primary care. And then you think about medical treatment. You've got, as you guys correctly said, alpha blockers, tantalizing alpha-sin, prazosin. You've got five alpha reductase inhibitors, such as dutasprine and finasprine. And so the, the, the way the alpha blockers work is that the smooth muscle around the bladder neck. Is composed of, there are multiple alpha receptors on there, and you can drop them, they uh, smooth muscle and mar marginally increase in the diameter of the bladder neck and urethra, the and therefore people's flow improves. And sometimes it's what it takes as a marginal increase. You only need a, a diameter of meat, you only start feeling symptoms when the diameter of the urethra goes down to so about uh, eight reps, so that's that, that's that timing. That's a pediatric feeding tube. Okay, so this is the effect of the prostate that. And as I say, you know, prostate smooth muscle receptors are, uh, uh, prostate smooth muscles in, has got a lot of powerful adrenergic receptors. If you block them, they increase the flow, and the density including, of the receptors do change with prostate size. And there are lots of different subtypes, and, you know, these, the tamsulosin and the alpusosins, they are all slightly more specific with slightly less side effect profiles to those alpha receptors. Translation seems to be in vogue at the moment. It's mostly clinical studies have been done. Of course, they have side effects because there are alpha receptors everywhere. There are alpha receptors on your um, uh, blood vessels and your, the actual blood itself, um, and so you know, in the eyes. And so people can get quite significantly hypotensive if they're already pre-existing. You know, they've got labor, blood pressure, they get dizziness, lightheadedness, fainting, retrograde ejaculation. Does anyone know what that is? What is it? Yeah, so it basically goes backwards. And the reason is that you relax the smooth muscle at the center. And so, therefore, um, it, sorry, but you release the relaxed smooth muscle at the bladder neck, so therefore it's weaker at the bladder neck. The only when they ejaculate, the bladder neck contracts. So, ejaculate back. And this can be really distress, distressing for, for young guys that you start on uh, 
outlook. So they, they freak out. Um, and then we have to pick up pieces. So it's terrible. Five R productives and inhibitors. There are lots of different five R productives and inhibitors. Type one and type two. Type two are the ones that we like to target. The genetic medicine side effects of blocking dihydrogen testosterone and conversion. Sorry, testosterone and conversion to dihydrogen testosterone. You would say if I was to cut off the testosterone supply, what could it happen to you? Okay. Even one even door engine, I was just thinking what's the message was on. Okay. You can do it, yes. Right. You would definitely be a judge. Because that's probably not as exciting as you can say. Correct. Yeah, to get osteoporosis. Can we use muscle mass? Yeah, uh, mass is a good one. Back to the eyes a lot. Yeah, so people, in fact, the wives are often noticed that the guys with the side on them tend to be a bit more violent, a bit familiar. Um, and so, yeah, all these things are significant side effects for men. Is it also decreased from our fatty holding side? Yes, we do start. Uh, so there is, you can give a bar product, isn't it? I don't actually know the evidence for that. I mean, I think it does work because it seems to be prescribed by. I don't know if that's all you said, right? Mm -hmm. um, but yeah. <laughs> and as you might say, it stops the end. You can merge on the line of the testosterone to PhD. And you see this is how it works, basically. It just takes the balance towards something by walking that something. What about you doing? Getting both. Combination therapy, good idea or bad idea? Sorry. <laughs> I mean, actually, the only thing that works in the combination therapy is if you give it individually, we haven't noticed that you're, you don't actually reduce the size of the prostate um, significantly to, dis to stop disease progression. You can alleviate it, and the disease process is probably still going on. But the only trials that have come out, the, the, the trials that have come out show that giving the combination can actually um, stop disease progression. And of course, the surgery. A surgery is very simple. It's, it's you know, the most common operation we do is a TURP, which is tracking the little section of the prostate. Um, and for very, very big prostates, we want to cut the tummy and we put our hands in and scoop out the big, big prostate out of them and then uh, and then stitch it all up. That results in quite a lot of blood loss, so we try and avoid that. We only deserve that with a very, very big prostate. But um, the thing is, though, know, that there, there are lots of different techniques that seem to come out. And a lot of these are, I think some of them are very well. Like, good evidence case behind them, like Tomek. So, Tomek is using a laser, which is a whole new laser, to contact with the laser and that. All that process happens, and it removes that middle bit of the prostate. And then, uh, and it basically replicates an open prostate with a endoscopic And then you have all these different types of lasers and stents that all of their function is to do is to just improve the, is to remove the bulk of the, bulk of the tissue that. Blocking the urethra, so that the blood is passed. It's a purely mechanical operation. Uh, and lots of little inventions have come out, many of them to uh, accelerate the income of the urologist. Some of them have some like evidence base, like TURP, Millen's prostate, and Hola. Green light has an increasing evidence base behind it. The stents don't really work. Um, but, but there are reasons that we have to do it. And when I say we have to do it, it means that you know, you know your patient's got to be somewhat relatively fit. Because what's the what is the alternative? What if you can't do an operation for someone who has got high pressure chronic retention and is has a renal function deteriorating? Intermittent self-catheterization. Intermittent self-catheterization. Anything else? What's the alternative to intermittent self-catheterization? Like yeah, super pubic. So, so, so there are always get out clauses. Things. People want to be free of catheters going in between their legs and the, the risk of infection. So, if you can do an operation, we, we try to. And you do it for acute urinary retention for people who've got lots of blood vessels coursing on the surface of their prostate, they get hematuria, recurrent urinary tract infections, bladder calculi, high pressure retention, and severe loss despite medical treatment. So, these are the absolute indications for treatment. And this is a TURP. You know, it's the gold standard at the moment, it still remains the gold standard, and it does work. These guys who come in with 
avoiding symptoms or symptoms of difficulty weaning, you'll also have storage symptoms. Because as you have a big prostate, it affects the potential pressure and the dynamics of the bladder. And by treating with a BPH, 50% of them will have their bladder symptoms removed. So it's still worth doing it. And there are complications. So who knows what TUR syndrome is? Syndrome. Yeah. So you get hypo and you know why? Um, because the fluid you use during the is glycine and it's not glycine or small. Yeah. So we don't just use water to saline and go through. I mean, there's some procedures that can do that. Uh, but for a TUR, we need to use something called glycine. And glycine um, conducts electricity. That's why we use it. Because water doesn't, because uh, the, the because the polarity of water it just disperses energy, the same thing with sodium chloride. So, in order, to, by, by using this uh, solution, the problem is that it's um, hyperosmolar. Okay, so it doesn't have the same osmolarity as blood. And with as you're scraping away bits of prostate, you're opening up little blood vessels, and then you're pushing the irrigation fluid under pressure. So all that fluid ends up in your blood suit. It's all about 100 mils every minute. So. So that's why we limit our resection times to about an hour. Stop them because you don't want them to get this dilution of hyponatremia uh, because they can become very, very sick of it. So the, the problem, and that's why it's is like doing a particular procedure of a, a spinal anesthetic because you can monitor those things. You can speak to the patient, they'll get numbers and tingling, they'll say, oh, my hands are tingling, what's going on here? Uh, whereas you all just like them to be asleep, they feel like everyone to be asleep. <laughs> so, we, so for a big prostate, maybe percent for ages, you always check their urine and electrolytes afterwards, check their sodium level. You can drop the hemoglobin and they can drop the sodium. And um, if you do have TUR syndrome, does anyone know what the management of it is? It's cool to see someone on the ward who's had TUR and he's completely gone nuts. And pre existing, he wasn't like that. Yeah, so the first things first, the usual ABC. Business, so you know, make sure that you're using oxygenation, you get two big candles, uh, send some bloods off, check their sodium. And then fluid restriction is probably the right answer, but it doesn't necessarily bring their sodium down very quickly. Do you want to bring some sodium down very quickly? It depends on how quickly it is. That's true. What's the problem with uh, bringing some sodium down so quickly? Yeah, so yeah, you get that basically. Home. So you don't, you don't want that. So you, you know, you, what you can do is you can give a little bit of charisma. Charisma. These guys go straight to the intensive care unit because they get you can get very sick and they can be this is just a disaster. And then of course you've got late complications as well. So whether it be incontinence or impotence, urethral strictures later, any form of urological intervention for the urethra can result in stricture formation. And that basic blood and exonosis is basically the same thing as a stricture, which is at the level of blood neck. And this is a millions operation. I don't know why they're not the people at the bottom of the when you really do that. Uh, but you basically scoop out the adenoma and then close it off. And that's only for very, very large prostates. Is that the same way you go to the Yeah, it's, it's quite a lot. It's just it's like scooping out a little. It's just put your finger in. How many would you go down? Oh, many people. Not many. Does that have a large effect on confidence? Uh, yes, but, but usually the effect on continence isn't because you've damaged the sphincter. It's because these people probably have underlying bladder overactivity, and that bladder overactivity was always controlled because they had a prostate to stop the bladder from pushing out of the urine. As soon as you take this big, huge prostate out, suddenly it's got nothing to control the bladder, so all the urine is coming from. So they do get incontinent. You can often start on land to to help calm the bladder down. And then, of course, you've got the minimally invasive. Things. And everything minimally invasive other than TURP is to achieve results similar to or superior to TURPs by minimizing that, but minimizing anesthetic stuff, the complications of TUR syndrome, resecting the saline, all sorts. I have some images, but they don't really work. Uh, but we do do pre lockers that come um, all the while we seal the laser, bits of laser that we use in order to try and scoop out that surprise there. That's all I got. Just the retrograde ejaculation. Yeah. Um, how does that get? Do they notice that at the time, or is it sort of on urination? 
Uh, it's on your own. So actually, what will happen is that guys having sex will notice that they're not they're just not coming. So when to go? Yeah. And so they they freak out. I like it. My girlfriend freaks out. Or someone freaks out as well. <coughs> Do pee? They often notice that pee is a bit cloudy in the morning. So yeah. So I'm going to talk about a little bit of trauma. But it's up to you if you want to hear. This is actually more to do. So this is more fun. Don't take notes. So, um, that's quite simple. There are only very few neurological organs. There's just we've only got two kidneys, two ureters, a bladder, a prostate, a penis, and then and uh, testicles. All of them can be used. Renal trauma, we'll talk about renal trauma first. So renal trauma basically a lot of it is due to blood trauma. Unless you're sort of living in a, a country where um, gun violence or knife related to in in violence is quite um, significant like in South Africa, you won't see much penetrating trauma. In most countries you'll see blood trauma with it. And it's the third most common organ to be involved in adults, and uh, they represent 10% of all sorts of physical injuries. Now the problem is in children it's the most common injury. Do you know what that is? Why is it in adults it's the third most common even when kids suddenly it becomes the most common? Is it lower injury? Yeah, that's absolutely right. So it sits slightly lower, and the other thing is that the ribs aren't as strong. Okay, so they're not, they're not completely ossified. So it's very good for the, uh, the kids to be injured. And you never, as of all trauma talks, you know, remember all the other stuff, so I'll be able to see And they tend not to be isolated and really injuries. People tend to present with hematuria, hypotension, and uh, and basically the, the injuries that result in are deceleration injuries. And you always suspect it in anyone with a splenic injury or a, a, a liver laceration. The thing here is that most of the countries that we've got, they uh, we we sort of we've kind of seen any of this. In is you're going to get CT scans very quickly. So even if you're not suspecting a renal trauma, you'll find that very very so CT scans are very good. Uh, to tell you this. Do you know what trauma CT is normally for kind of phase the, the scans are done in? Yeah. And why is that? Um, I see it's for any Yeah, I mean, the reason is, uh, yeah, because what, what kills you? It will be an arterial end of the You know, everything else can wait and do the main phases later. But what you want is a quick arterial end you inject contrast or between 60 and 90 seconds and then you stay on the patient. So that's by then everything will come through the heart and hope to most likely be in our system. <clears throat> so real injuries are divided into grade one to five. Uh, and this this is basically it, all it is is that you have a grade one injury is a bruise. So the way I remember it is a grade one injury is a bruise. Grade two injury it is a cut and the cut. By a cut means it's a laceration less than one centimeter. A grade two, a grade three injury is a deep cut, so that's greater than one centimeter. A grade four injury is a deep wet cut, so it's an injury that goes through the peritoneum into the collecting system, so that's why it's wet because it's of urine. And a grade uh, five injury, a grade four injury can also be a segmental vessel injury here, like one of these things that's like gone. And a grade five injury is where you have completely shattered kidney. Renal and a high risk of renal loss. So, basically, what are the treatments for for these? Is anyone share some treatments that we have for uh, renal trauma? What do you think the most common treatments? Yeah, that's a good point. I'd say the most common grades are grades one to three. And what does that involve? Not doing anything. Yeah. That's absolutely right. It's, it's amazing because things have changed in the management of renal trauma significantly over the last 50 years. It used to be that nephrect, you know, if you saw some blood in the retroperitoneum, if you're doing a lap, if you're a general surgeon doing a lap, or um, whatever it means, spleen, and you saw a little bit of blood in the retroperitoneum, you think, well, what should we do? More often than not, they would explore the retroperitoneum at the same sitting and then take out a because you disrupt a clock and you see active bleeding, you can't put the bleeding kidney back in. So you take it out. And so a lot of kidneys being lost out there. And actually, now with the advent of interventional radiology, 
the big get out way is of limiting opera intervention for isolated or ill injuries. And so <clears throat> we tend to absolutely right wherever you can, if the patient's hemodynamically stable, blood, um, their hemoglobins are stable and to lift them drop their hemoglobin in an integral period of time, uh, and their hematuria is okay, and they have lots of other or they have any other injuries associated, we tend to manage them conservatively. They usually involve coming in, strict bed rest, observe for about 24 to 48 hours, make sure there's no heat flow and change is coming and going. Sometimes you need to follow them up with a scan. And we tend to use a DMSA or a free scan just to check the function of the kidney. Sometimes you don't need to be there. It's just a great one if you're in a bruise. It's very unlikely something else, you know, long term damage is going to happen. So, what is uh, a DMSA, which is a, uh, which basically is a DMSA scan. And basically, it's measures split, um, split function between two kidneys. So, one might work in the 50%, the other might work in the 30%, you know, they put that up to 100%. Well. So, 70% to 30% is a normally 50 50. So you've got some scarring and trauma to crop the function on the one side. The only reason is to really actively intervene and take someone's kidney out is if they're a hypotensive patient um, and you know you have a lot of international radiology on the side, or you have a lot of time to transfer them, then you don't take them upstairs and put them in the case. Often, I mean we have had to do it because of other injuries. So very hypertensive patients in the context of was um, uh, a guy with a pancreatic, uh, he had a complete pancreatic disruption. So all this pancreatic juice is sort of flowing around as I've gone from county and a very bad renal injury as well. Repairing the kidney wasn't really an option because it's unlikely to heal in the presence of pancreatic. And we do it, so we, we took it out. So it still does happen in but very rarely. And then if you can take the international radiology, that would be the best way. So, snapshot pictures. I'll direct this one, we'll break that. So what can you tell from the scan? First of all, who wants to tell me about the scan? What scan is it? It's not a trick question. This is a CT scan, yeah. So that's the first question you've got to ask, always. Because it's got one kidney. You don't want to be rushing and to take, take that out or embolizing the, the entire kidney. You, know, you need to make sure we have got two kidneys and two functional kidneys. It's very important there. So this is um, a lot of blood which is trapped outside one of the kidneys. This is contrast within the collecting system, that's why it's white. You can't, you can't see any active contrast sides, so it's nothing white outside to, to contain the internal in that kidney. So it's got a great one, pretty bad great one. This is a grade two injury with a laceration down. The arrows help. It's <laughs> slightly longer. So it's pretty simple. The grade four is involved in the collecting system. You can see it completely smashed. There's a lot of blood that's been trapped on that side of the ridge parasitic. But there's no active con there's no active contrast of derivation. Yeah, no, no, no. If they're stable. But we try our very best because you know over the course of someone's lifetime, you know, all they need to get is diabetes up. Okay, so we, we, we do have to try our best. Would you do it open fashion? No, it, it's very difficult to do a part. So you can do a part of the it's very obvious what the injury is and you can close it, but stable patient, you want to make them as stable as quick as possible. And the problem with the part of the is that you risk a whole host of other complications that could potentially result like re bleeding. Um, and maybe you often do the the most definitive form of them, and more often than not, that's true. There are circumstances you can do a part of them. You, you've got to be pretty, uh, pretty confident that your your repairs you, you will heal without the issues with the skull. Because if, if someone has a weaving, so for example, if they have a very catastrophic uh, weaving injury and they're you know, going to go into ATM, they're going to be on intensive care, they're putting anything there that will sustain an inflammatory response. So, I'll show you that you take the whole kidney in. We do partial and everything, you know, we then have to re embolize the entire kidney, which then sets you back a step. So, you can, one has to be quite confident about that. And this is a completely disruptive kidney, as you can tell. And this is the obvious easy pathway that we've got. It's very simple. Basically, you know, 
would all it's it all all of this is it, it just it just tells you unstable the management conservative you've got someone that's unstable your first point of call is can, can you safely transfer that guy to into a radiology suite you can't explore uh, if you've got a you know Someone who's in, in, in dire straits, they need to explore quickly. And the other complicating factor is knowing whether they have one or two treatments. So, this is a, you can see this is the source of the This is an angiogram, so a renal angiogram. So, you inject contrast into the kidneys, the main, the main renal artery on the left. All the vessels, and these are upper bowel vessels. And you can see here, these are, they, they, to know what a normal angiogram is, you just follow the vessels right to the end. And if they look nice and crisp, they're okay. There's a bit of a blush to contrast with the elevation. So that is where the uh, ready potential radiologists are lifesavers, and they'll probably put a coil in here to stop that from happening. And this is just like in, in theatre when you have a, uh, a, a real laceration. You know where this is going to go, so I'm going to So, bladder. So, tell me about the bladder. So, uh, the bladder is, is quite a unique organ because it's so there's a portion of it which is extra peritoneal, which lies beneath the peritoneal anterior, and a portion of it which is intraperitoneal. So the anterior two thirds, uh, anterior third of the bladder is an intraperitoneal organ. It's in contact with all the bowel of that. Whereas most of it is actually extra peritoneal, so it lies underneath the peritoneal cavity. That makes a difference when we manage bladder trauma. So again, the most common mechanism of bladder, bladder trauma is blunt trauma. And it's usually with seat cover laser injuries on a full bladder, or maybe it's very rare for someone to be stabbed in the bladder. Um, but it can happen. And so again, and it's quite a rare injury because it represents less than two percent of the dominant injuries that require surgery. It is almost always associated with it's related to blunt trauma. It is almost always associated with other severe injuries, mainly um, pelvic um, injuries. Because most people who have bladder, you know, sort of, no one just presents with an isolated bladder injury unless they just uh, unless they are there is a kind of dreading injury to the bladder or they have a bladder kick in a full bladder. Most of it is associated with pelvic trauma and pelvic fractures. Because the bladder is supported within the pelvis, and all it takes is a shear force for that uh, to cause a, a disruption. And again, motor vehicle accidents. That is why the mortality of people with bladder injuries is very high, because it's often in the context of other injuries. So, a high association with bladder fractures, so nearly 80, so you know, the high 80s. <coughs> and people who have bladder injuries um, are rare. And you can see how that happens. And this is someone who's had a, quite a bad, unstable pelvic fracture. And you can see how bone fragments can easily enter in and out of the bladder. Nearly always they have hematuria. We have signs that if someone comes in with, after a trauma and they have visible hematuria, one must always suspect urethral or bladder trauma. Um, and if you have got blood, it's obviously more associated with a more significant injury. What's the diagnostic test to tell if someone's got a bladder rupture? Probably not. It's quite difficult to get a cystoscope down the stairs into the emergency department and set it all up and have a look inside and sort the lies and can't see what's going on. Is there a tear or is there a rent in the bladder? Is there anyone? Uh, so, dipstick, you'll see if there's blood. If there is blood, you need to do something. Someone's going to tell us that. Tap into the bladder, first of all. Absolutely. So, what's that called? Uh, so that's an, an extra KB is just plain x ray of the kidney geosis of the bladder. It doesn't tell us where the contrast is. So, a cystogram, what you do is you put, a, you put a, uh, a catheter into the bladder. You can do a cystogram in the urethra, and you just put just the catheter into the tip of the urethra, and you fill the uh, bladder and the urethra with contrast. And if there's no leak, Uh, contrast disappearing out into the distance. But if there is a leak, there will be. And the pattern of that leak will tell you where that rupture is. So we'll go on and talk about that. Again, principles of management, usual stuff. The questions you have to ask is if there are urethral injuries, the bladder uh, rupture intra peritoneal. So if there's a dome of the bladder injury, if there's a hole at the top of the dome, the only next place is the, the, the 
that's there is is parallel carotene account to so injury, or is it extra carotene? And then you always have to ask, is there other rheological injuries present and manage the immaturity? I'll tell you why. So usual signs and symptoms, lower abdominal pain, distension, bruising, immaturity, and poorly trained encounter. Because if you don't figure it out early on, patients will be they'll be on, they'll be pyrexic because you'll be, you know, because they'll they'll have a catheter in. They may may or may not have a catheter in, they'll have urine sloshing around their uh, peritoneal cavity or extra or extra peritoneum having forming collections which then get infected and they become very unwell. They don't void successfully because you can only you know you generate a pressure and that pressure's up further out through the urethra. If the hole is bigger than the, the diameter of your urethra, it will preferentially drain the other way. Worsening renal function because they're absorbing urine and of course they get a chemical peritonitis. A lot of the urethral venatus is always a uh, something you need to get with. It's present in 50% of people with urethral injuries and about 10% of those with bladder injury. So do the retrograde system of your urethral ground. If you're worried about a urethral injury, should you pass a catheter or should you not pass a catheter? I mean, the answer is how worried are you? If I was to see someone with this, I'd be pretty worried. And so I would say, you know, it's probably worth us doing a, a cystic round before we put the cancer in. If I saw someone with who didn't have that uh, and just happened to have a pelvic fracture, I would probably put a cap in, but I wouldn't go and sit there trying to figure out all the maneuvers of trying to force this cancer into someone's bladder and go, doesn't go do cystic urethra and see. So you are entirely safe in placing a urethra cancer. I did one gentle attempt, and it shouldn't be the you know, uh, no senior doctor, one gentle attempt to pass me. If it doesn't go, then do a sister round. So, here you are, this is a sister urethra band. It's pretty 100% accurate in the large series. You know, you fill the, the, the bladder with about 350 mils of uh, contrast, and you just, and all you're doing is to look, look at this, the, the shape of the bladder. So, this is pretty normal looking bladder here at the moment. You know, there's a couple of little, little, little spots on the outside. These are diverticulae. The contrast is taken. You can also, because all these guys are going into CT scans for uh, pelvic fractures anyway, if you're worried about a bladder injury early on, you can always pop some contrast into the bladder before they go into the CT scanner, and that'll, it's just called a CT cystogram. It's just a time saving and uh, um, radiation um, sort of saving exercise. But uh, it'll also give you an anatomical context as to where the leaks are. So this is a CT cystogram, and you can see this is the abnormal outline of the bladder. The arrow points to a little rent here, and then there's contrast filling outside the bladder. And this is this is a, an extra peritoneal leak. So the, the fluid is sitting in the extra peritoneal leak, and this is the difference between an intraperitoneal leak. Because what happens in an intraperitoneal leak is you fill it up, but actually all the contrast is up here. It's coming up the sides, it's all the way inside the peritoneal cavity, it's outlining this, the bowel structure. It's not a great picture, but it does outline all the, stru the structures, all the, uh, the small bowel. So, so, it's quite a critical difference in management because if you don't have a hole into the peritoneal cavity, all you need to do is promote drainage through the urethra, and these holes will seal. They just take about two weeks to seal. So, you've got a very large catheter in, allow the urine to drain. Significant materials across and block the cancer, and most of these injuries will be. There are a very small subset of people where they don't hear and have to sort something out, but most of them we just send them home. The weeks, make sure the bladder has a nice outline and tick. If they have an intraperitoneal leak, it's an immediate operation, so they all tend to get a, a laparotomy. Again, and we find a hole in the bladder and stitch it up in two legs. So this is a hole in the bladder, you can turn the bladder here. And all we have to do, do is do a little bit of an absorbable suture. It has to be an absorbable suture if you don't want stones to form on it. Uh, and you just close them up into the, the bladder on the two layer. <coughs> um, and again, the, the extra peritoneal ones are often the ones that are associated with pelvic trauma. So here you have this flare pattern with an extra peritoneal leak. There's nothing on the inside. Okay. These, these are actual pictures from, from patients, and the reason they're rubbish quality is because they're done in the emergency department with the uh, normal unit. All right, where are we now? Ah, 
Where's the tool here? Okay. What's this distribution called? Yeah, it's a saddle. You can see the saddle of what it's called for the butter. And you get this butter for black reason. And it's in the perineum. And what organ runs through the perineum is good. Into the bladder. This is usually a urethral trauma. So urethral trauma tends to present like this because what happens is the, the blood attracts outside butt fascia and spreads, but stays within collies and scarless fascia, so you get this sort of butterfly appearance. And that's what this is what people tend to they sometimes they have sore and sort of scrotum as well if they have other injuries. Now the thing with urethral trauma is it's 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 very sick. It's it's quite you know, if you're worried about your urethral trauma, you just need to divert your own away from the urethra. So you can either do that with a urethral catheter, just safely placed on the cystoscopic guidance, or you put a supercubic catheter and deal with your urethra later. And here, that, that was an example of where the prostatic urethra is completely separated from the numerous urethra. So we just couldn't have to do a supercubic catheter and ultrasound guidance. So just a brief question, do you mind just outlining that special favor? So you don't see it here because they're internal, they're on the inside. Yeah, no problem on the next slide. So, oh here? Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah good question. I don't even know where it is. Okay. <laughs> so this is probably one. So the box fascia basically would be here. And it only surrounds the penis and attaches to the pubic bone and it comes down on the knee. Now we'll put a bunch on our, our outline that bit later. The, the, so it's the, it's the innermost fascia there. Okay, and then outside of that, um, scarfers and campers. Okay, campers going down all the way to the thighs, I think, uh, and the scarfer goes in the other direction up, up towards the, the chest somewhere. Um, but effectively, what, what it means is that if you have a urethral injury up here, because the attachment is over here and here, you're not going to get blood tracking underneath here, so the penis isn't going to get swell, swell up uh, like an oak Blood's going to track on the outside. I don't know if I'm explaining that very well. Uh, you'll see from what with the next picture is what I mean by happens uh, when you have a fox fashion injury. So this is a, a, a urethra lamp. It's the same thing, you put a little catheter into the tip of the penis, you inject contrast, and you watch. In a normal urethra lamp, you get this natural flow of urine here, you get a slight dilatation at the barber in urethra. These two narrowings are normal, this is the prostatic urethra here. So because the prostate's there, you get these little narrowings. This is what the sphincter would be. This is the bladder. So that's a normal urethra lamp. Here you have a completely disrupted urethra. You see all the contrast flying out in, in various directions. It looks like a bit of a flare. So that's completely disrupted urethra. So you wouldn't go and just wipe a catheter in the sky, put a super pubic in, and just wait. And let them get a result in the news. What's going on here? Uh, it surprised me that this guy might be circumcised. Yes. So what, what happens when you get a? So this is blood which is confined to the body. Okay. The blood's not escaping around the sides. It's not going down his thigh. It's confined to the buck fascia. It's confined to the penis. So if you saw someone like this in the emergency department, which is very likely because we get quite a few of these guys that come through, um, do you know what? What is the right to injury? It's confined to the penis. Why would blood escape from within the penis to outside the penis? There has to be some sort of mechanism of trauma. This is a penile fracture. Uh, and uh, this, is, this is a classical description of a penile fracture. This is an aubergine uh, penis that the penile dies get. And it's usually uh, a result of quite vigorous sexual intercourse. Uh, classically, women on top. And the, the, the perineum of the female lands on the erect penis. And there's a layer of Tunic garbage here, which snaps and breaks, and then you get a you get a you get a rush. And that is the, this is the repair. So they tend to all need repairing. So we basically this is a big lump penis completely, so all this thing is brought down. This is the injury here. And then you basically have to suture all that out. The reason we have to operate on these guys is because they have their risk of erectile dysfunction after this or deviation of the penis is, is quite high without it. So you've got about three days to sort this out. Um, Interestingly, they, you know, the, initial, the classic description of a penile fracture is that you know, usually 
during intercourse, usually female on top, or at least if they accidentally hit parent, you know, uh, the parent or female on head, and um, they, they usually get a crack. There's immediate due to medicine, so the erections immediately disappear. And, there's, so, so. and you know, you, usually we bring them in, but if, it, if it happens overnight, you can be next morning get prepared. Yeah, because ultimately you don't want these guys to have worse erectile function than they have. Penile amputations, very rare. This picture's only there because it's, it does happen every so often. And, and so these guys often get a sense, especially sense of and getting reattached, often uh, crimes of passion. What's the rate of these patients? Sorry? What's the rate of these patients? Well, it depends how quickly they get the. Number one, it depends on the finding of the penis. Number two, is if they bring it in on time and ice. And then the third thing is you can reattach it, but doesn't necessarily mean it survives. Sure. We don't do this here. And this, these are done in very specialist senses. And you know, back in the UK where I, where I trained, you know, we, we have had a couple of uh, very odd presentations. Of that. Do we do I don't think we do. There are very few senses that do more than the There are very few really who do that. And you know, I think I think we're now entering the random picture stage. <laughs> so this is a testicle. This is a, a an ultrasound scan of the testicle. This is the normal homogenous testicle. And this on the inside, this you can see it's a heterogeneous picture, which means it's fuzzier and you know it's more grey and black in there. And that's usually a testicular rupture or a bigger tumor, depending on the context. So because it's all on trauma, I suspect it's a testicular rupture, and this is the test we can see here. Uh, there's obviously it's bleeding. This is the tumor, the uh, tumor garbage near surrounding the testis, and you can see the inside of it is good over the and it's just the sum of the first tubules and all black. So this one, you're very unlikely to salvage this, and so you have to do it with the next thing. This actually is pretty quick. I've seen quite a few here, um, general Melbourne, who had a lot of in relation to straddling injuries and um, uh, road traffic accidents, we've had quite a few road traffic accidents in the trauma country. I think that's all I've got. <laughs> 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 Stay safe out there. <laughs> so, just had a question from you, a urologist point of yeah. view. Um, some of us are finding it's going to come into so, yeah. and there's a little bit of debate as to whether if you cause a little blocked or um, low urine output, do you flush the catheter or do you take it out and put it in one? So always remember your low urine output question to be answered for the whole is it pre renal renal or post renal? If you're convinced it's post renal course, then first flush the catheter. First, are you sure that the catheter is in the right place? If you're sure that the catheter is in the right place, is it blocked? Not just flush it and see. So the flush is in, you flush it out, you generally in like, that like position where it just comes across the dead or the bladder and it starts to start bleed. You start to go, you know, you've got to be okay. If it's not, then uh, because you're convinced that the catheter is still blocked, or if it's not flushing properly, then it probably is the catheter. You have to change the catheter. Does that mean? Flushing in there, if you know, the catheter's in the right place and it is flushing okay, then are you really sure the patient's producing your but some people say that you shouldn't flush a catheter because it would introduce uh, an infection to the bladder. I just think you might for maybe a couple of days. No, that's rubbish. Okay. Because if you look at a, a, the, the thing with a catheter is that after about 24 hours, all catheters are colonized with bacteria. The bladder will be colonized with bacteria. The key thing is that you're not flushing, you know. Yeah, you, you, you just maintain sterile principles, gloves, you know, aseptic techniques, and then you flush the catheter and then you should be okay. It's better to flush the catheter and make sure it's painful than leaving like someone in pain with a block catheter. We do it all the time, so that's safe. You shouldn't be afraid to, to do that. Anything else? Well, any, any questions? Any questions? Anything you don't know about urology that needs answering? You'll see a lot of it, so um, it's always a uh, big useful. It's, it's one of these things that's probably poorly taught in medical school because you just don't get as much exposure as you think you would need to. Um, but it's something that you end up seeing a lot of. 
And for some reason, there's always a big mystery as to why it's so complex. It's like some sort of super complex thing. But actually, it's just like it's very simple. You block, you can unblock it. Flushing it or reconnecting something. It's kind of sweet. You can't allow you can. And then there are obviously slightly more complicated bits to it. Cool. So please join me in thanking the document. Just one quick thing while Margaret comes down. Okay, just one quick thing. So.